the brief moment in which your eyes adjust to the darkness after switching off the lights, that's the moment you should be afraid of. The few drawn out seconds that your vision is shrouded in pitch black as you wait for your eyes to make sense of your surroundings. How many of those seconds before the outlines of your furniture come into view? Those are the seconds when you should be hiding. This is what my mother told me a long time ago, long before she passed away. These words have been stuck in my mind since the day I heard them, and they repeat themselves to me each night when I shut the lights off for bed. I keep a nightlight by my bedside, just like my mother always did. She told me this the day after my 11th birthday. I remember because we had spent my birthday on a day trip out of town to celebrate. My day was filled with frolicking in the hot sand on the beach and taking countless ocean waves straight to the face. Needless to say, I was exhausted. It was around 9pm when we got in the door, and I dropped my things in the hallway and dragged my heavy body to my bedroom. This moment should have been a blur, just like any other tired night. But after changing into my pyjamas and switching off the light, something happened. I switched off the light and the room around me became a dark void in every direction. My mother had kept a nightlight in my room for as long as I can remember, but tonight, I guess, the bulb had finally died. At that moment, I didn't give it a second thought. I had walked to my bed thousands of times up to this point in my life and I knew I could navigate there easily. I made my way across my bedroom, keeping my arms extended as to not bump into anything. Seconds passed of wandering across my room in the dark, and I had not yet reached my bed. I thought this was strange, but I quickly wrote it off as my tired brain getting me turned around and lost in my own room, despite it being a straight shot to my bed. I squinted and swiveled my head around, looking for any recognisable outlines of furniture, but my eyes had not yet adjusted to the light. In all directions, it was pitch black. Again, I blamed this on the day spent in the blinding sun and began to wiggle my arms around while I walked, hoping to make contact with anything in my room. There was nothing. A crippling pain surged in my chest as I became overwhelmed with panic. I tried to turn 180 degrees as accurately as I could, hoping to dash back to the light switch and flick it on. I took off full speed, but I never reached the wall. I never reached anything. My knees buckled under me and I collapsed to the floor, but there was no floor. No matter where I looked or how hard I flailed, my surroundings had been replaced with an empty abyss. I opened my mouth and I screamed. No sound came from my mouth, but I could feel my vocal cords burning and vibrating. I continued to scream, emptying my lungs several times over. My face was wet with tears and my throat felt tore open, but I never heard a sound. I don't know how long I stayed in that gap of emptiness, just outside of reality. My mother said she had only heard my ear-splitting wails for a second before she rushed into the room and switched the light on. I remember the look on my mother's face in that moment. It was the first time I'd ever seen a look of absolute terror on the face of an adult. My mother, the pinnacle of an unwavering spirit, looked completely broken. That night, my mom didn't let me out of her sight. She made me a cup of warm tea with honey to soothe my throat. She listened patiently while I told her what had happened but she never seemed surprised. She replaced a nightlight in my room with a new one from a box she kept in the closet. I slept in her room that night with the lights on. The next morning, she waited patiently for me to wake up and she had a warm cup of tea ready by the bedside. She stood by until I was ready to hear the answers to my questions about the night before. She explained to me about an exit door to reality they can only be passed through in specific circumstances. My mother told me that if a person stays in that blackness for just a few too many seconds, they will be lost forever. It was then that the night lights in every room of the house made sense. 
That was nine years ago, and I've never made the same mistake again. So, why am I sharing this information now? My mother passed away last week. I was the one who found her body. She was lying in the middle of a bedroom floor, the sun shining onto her through the window and her eyes swollen and bulging from her face. Her hands were curled in unnatural positions like a frightened animal. The following hours were a blurry mess, consumed by talks with the police and EMTs. They told me then that the cause of death was a heart attack, confirmed days later by the autopsy. In an attempt to comfort me, they told me that it happened suddenly and was over all at once. They said she wouldn't have suffered at all. But I knew better. I still know better. My mother suffered immensely when she passed, and she may still be suffering now. I don't want to think about what it must be like for her right now. I just know that when I found her body that morning, I couldn't help but notice that the nightlight by her bed was burnt out. After my last post, I received a lot of messages encouraging me to go back into the abyss. It is something I had not even considered, and initially, I shut the idea down completely. It was difficult enough just to write out the experience I had when I was a child, so there was no way I would intentionally go back. I thought of it as a slap in the face to my late mother, who spent my whole life trying to protect me from that. However, the more responses I received, the clearer it became that people genuinely believed there was a chance I could bring my mother back from the abyss. I slept on it. I waited a few days, but the thought never left my mind. Each passing day, my head was filled with more guilt at the thought of leaving my mother alone in that void. I pictured her weeping, but no sound coming out, just like when I was lost in there. Her cries, her movements, her thoughts all consumed by a starving darkness. I had to go back. I spent an entire evening corresponding with other users on here, making sure all of my bases were covered within reason. I wrote down each good idea and started planning. The first step was to reach out to a friend for help. I did this in the form of a lengthy message explaining everything. I wasn't sure I could face somebody calling me crazy to my face right then. I sent the complete message to a longtime friend, Mia. She knew what I was going through with my mom, and she had promised to be there for me if I needed anything. I know this probably wasn't what she had in mind. I told her that if she doesn't believe me, then don't bother replying. But if she wanted to help, she could meet me at my house at a specific time with some extra supplies. Mia showed up two hours after I sent the message. I almost didn't believe it until I opened the door and saw her face. She had a backpack on and a look of determination that made everything else feel just a little more normal. I pulled her into a hug before either of us spoke a word and we stood there in the doorway for quite some time. I don't think either of us knew what to say. I broke the silence. Thank you. She stepped through the front doorway and put her hand on my back. It's what friends are for. I laughed for the first time in over a week. Not exactly. Mia started down the hallway toward my room while pulling off a backpack. I brought 150 feet of static rope, a timer, a tactical flashlight, and this. She pulled out a long string of what appeared to be fairy lights. I shot her a quizzical look. She explained, They're for backup. We can wrap them around you, just in case you lose your flashlight or something. They're battery operated, and it's just a quick button press to turn them on. She demonstrated by flicking a button at the end of the string, and sure enough, the whole thing lit up nice and bright. I had to admit, it was a good idea. I'm grateful that you came here, really. I couldn't do this alone. She smiled at me while she continued to empty out the backpack. She emptied out several boxes of batteries and began separating them into small plastic bags. 
I stood back and admired her preparedness. We spent the next half hour checking and rechecking the supplies while waiting for the sun to go down. Once it was dark enough outside that there was no light coming in through my curtains, we figured it was time to start. I didn't feel ready, but I don't think I ever would have. We tied the static rope around my waist and practiced tugging on it, hard, to make sure it wouldn't come loose. Mia's logic was that if I got turned around inside the void like before, I could just follow the rope and it would lead me back to the door. We wrapped the fairy lights around my body loosely, but pinned securely to my clothes in several places. I took Mia's backpack full of assorted batteries for each of the lights, and I kept the flashlight gripped tightly in my hand, but turned off for now. We decided that we would start with a 30 second timer, and Mia would switch the bedroom lights back on when the timer went off. Mia stood by the light switch to my room, one end of the rope wrapped tightly around her hand. Ready? She looked me in the eyes when she asked. I couldn't answer. I thought if I opened my mouth to reply, I might say no. I might say, this is silly, let's just stop it now and have a normal sleepover. Instead, I nodded and forced my lips into a hopefully convincing smile. The last thing I saw before the room went dark was the heavy look of unease in Mia's eyes. Then, it was black. The room was so quiet that I could hear my own breathing. I could still feel my feet on the ground, so I began to walk in a direction. I kept my eyes squinted, looking for outlines in the inky darkness. Part of me hoped my eyes would adjust and I'd see myself in the bedroom mirror, tied up with lights and rope, looking ridiculous. But they didn't. In fact, it seemed like my surroundings were only somehow getting darker with time, as if being washed away by an ocean of thick, black oil. I took a deep breath and realized then that my sound had left me. I felt my lungs fill with air, but heard nothing. So, this was it. But, now what? My legs kept moving in a walking direction, but it ceased making contact with the ground. It was impossible to tell if I was even covering any distance at this point. In the void, my movements had no pushback. When I tried to walk or swim or float, it was just flailing. Moments passed and a sense of hopelessness crept its way steadily into my mind. There was nothing for me here. The only physical sensation I could discern was my own heart sitting heavy in my chest. I decided I would just wait out the timer and then put this plan to rest. How long had it been already? It felt like it had been minutes, but I knew this was just my own anxious perception. Regardless, it could only be a few more seconds left now. I started to count myself. One, two, three. I kept my eyes wide open, waiting to be blinded by my bedroom light. I continued to wiggle my limbs around, there wasn't anything else to do. 10, 11, 12, any second now. I waited. I tapped my fingers on my stomach with each second counted. 28, 29, 30. The light never came on. I stayed there, suspended in the void, counting each tap on my fingers. I counted past one minute. Past this point, I couldn't stop my mind from racing. I began to cycle through all the possibilities of what could be happening in the real world. Why hadn't Mia hit the light switch yet? I remembered our failsafes and began to frantically feel around for my flashlight. As soon as I made contact, I hit the power button. I could feel the warmth of the powered flashlight in my hand, but any light that would be emanating from it was instead being swallowed up by the void. In frustration, I pointed the thing directly into my eyes. I could feel my retinas stinging and my cheeks getting damp with tears, but I couldn't see a thing. I knew I was panicking. I could feel my own chest rising and falling rapidly. I could feel the cool air entering my lungs, followed by the hot air exiting into the abyss. I still had one thing left. The rope. 
I took a shaggy breath in, not sure what was going to happen to me if I slid my hands down my torso in search of the rope. My hands stopped on the coarse material tied around my waist. I breathed a sigh of relief. I pulled the rope, hoping to feel myself propelled towards it, but the rope was slack. It was too slack. I ran my hand down the length of rope, and it was only a few seconds before it slipped out of my hand, and I realized I had reached the end. The rope was severed when I passed through the darkness. Of course it was. I had nothing left. My body felt tired, despite not moving much. My breaths came in short bursts. I couldn't tell if it was my anxiety or if the void was closing in on me. I imagined myself being physically crushed by the darkness. I pictured myself suffocating as the abyss closed in on me. I began to lose track of which sensations were real and which I was willing into existence. I lost track of my body. I lost track of time. I don't know how long I spent like this. After a while, it felt like hours had passed. I began to think about my mom. I wondered if this is exactly how she felt when she passed. Was she scared like me? Or did she feel prepared? I wondered how long she spent thrashing around, trying to fight back against the empty space. I wondered where she was now. Was she still out there? She could be right next to me, I thought, just out of reach. But I would never know. My thoughts continued like this for some time. My sense of time had left me long ago. But eventually, I knew days must have passed me by. I'd reached the point of pure silence then. There were no more thoughts buzzing around in my head. My anxiety had left me. And with it, my inkling of humanity. I had no control over my movement anymore. Or if I did, I couldn't tell. That's why it came as a shock to my system. When I heard a sound. Like a jolt of electricity through each of my nerves came a noise from the distance. My sense of distance was skewed, if there at all. But if I focused hard enough, I could hear it. I had nothing else I could do, so I just listened. The sound was somehow foreign, yet familiar. I knew that I could pinpoint what it was with enough time, but I was so worried it would leave me just before I put my finger on it. The sound struck me to my core. This faint whisper of a noise shook my bones. It was so soft, but I could feel it reverberate up my spine, down my arms and out of my fingertips. But what was it? I listened. I listened so hard that I was sure I would given myself a headache if I could feel my head. Then it finally registered. I was hearing the sound of my mother's cries, a sound I'd never heard before. I was struck with a sense of motivation I hadn't felt in the eternity I'd spent in this void. I'd have leapt for joy if I could control my legs. I'd have sprinted towards her. I'd have held her in my weak arms. I never would have let her go. But then, there was light. Blinding, burning, stinging, painfully intense light. Terrible light. Dreaded light. The cries were gone, and it was only light. My bones ached, my head was full of a searing fire, my mouth was dry and my throat sore. The sound of a friendly voice nearby. So, how was it? Mia's voice, just a few feet away. I turned my neck, slowly, like a rusted gear. I tried to respond, but my body didn't cooperate. I watched Mia approach me with a glass of water. I was back in my bedroom. There was another noise that had faded into the background, an irritating beep on repeat. The timer. I used the last of my strength to sit up, and Mia helped me to the bed. She sat with me, an eager expression on her face as I gulped down the water she had brought me. My throat feeling slight relief, I spoke. Why did you leave me in there for so long? What happened? My questions came out like venom. Mia looked at me like I'd slapped her. She held up the timer, still beeping. The numbers flashed on the screen. 30 seconds. 
I couldn't believe it. Mia stayed with me for the rest of the night, but I wasn't ready to talk about my experience. She was understanding and she left the next morning. She told me to reach out when I was ready to talk or try it again. It's been several days since those events and I've barely had the physical strength to leave my bed. 30 seconds in the abyss has wrecked my health. I've thought about going to the hospital, but I wouldn't know what to say. As I've recovered, there has really only been one thing in my mind. I have to go back. I know it's crazy. I know I'll probably die, but I don't know what else to do. My mother is in there. I heard her cries, somewhere beyond the darkness. Days after my last venture into the abyss, I was finally feeling ready to get moving again. I'd spent several days in bed, barely able to feed myself. For a few of those days, I really thought my body would give up and I'd wither away. Part of me is convinced that the only thing keeping me alive is the thought of seeing my mother again when I recover and return to the abyss. Yes, I was planning on returning to the abyss. At that point, there wasn't anything that could have stopped me. I truly hoped I could find my mother in there and bring her back. I'd accepted that my next venture would kill me, but there wasn't any other option. Because of this, I knew I couldn't tell Mia about my plans. I knew she would try to stop me. I got my supplies together, just in case, and I waited until the last minute to send Mia a message. In the message, I thanked her for all of her help and let her know that she might not see me again. I figured she would know immediately what was happening, but by then, it would be too late for her to change anything. With everything prepared, I stood in my doorway with my hand on my bedroom light switch. It took up until this point, but it dawned on me that I didn't really have a plan in place. I truly knew nothing about the nature of the abyss. I could only hold on to the hope that I'd hear my mother's cries again and I'd be able to navigate towards them. That is all I had to go off of. When I tried to picture a plan laid out in front of me, all I could visualize was that hopeless chasm I'd been lost in twice before. Each time, I'd had someone there to pull me out of it. This time, I was alone. But I'm not, I told myself. Mom is in there, waiting for me. I remembered how long those 30 seconds had felt before and I wondered again how Mom felt floating in that deep darkness for weeks now. Part of me hoped that in all of that time, maybe she had learned something about the void. Maybe she knew things that I didn't, and we could put our heads together to make it out alive. Another part of me remembered the way my sanity slipped from my grasp so easily a week ago, and after only 30 seconds. I considered that my mother's brain could just be inhuman mush by now, lost to the clutches of the void. What if, by now, her soft sobs had gutted out and been consumed like everything else in there? I couldn't think about that now. I couldn't live with myself if I walked away from this. Soon, Mia might be knocking on my door, and then I'd lose my chance to make things right. I had to go. I hit the light switch. This time, I didn't move. I just waited. I tried not to count or focus my thoughts on anything. I didn't want to waste any time. I stayed put and anticipated my mind becoming unbound inside that endless room full of nothing. I awaited my body melting away until I was just the point of consciousness with all physicality disabled and then even that would be washed away into that now familiar sea of desolation. I waited. I thought I would be ready this time when I passed through the gateway out of reality but I felt just as terrified as the other times. No matter how much I mentally prepared myself, my animal brain could not find comfort in the darkness. When I could no longer feel the floor beneath my feet, I flared my limbs in panic. It was a wholly unnatural sensation to be floating, but not falling. Like each time before, it was impossible to rationalize my silent but panicked breaths. I placed my hands on my face to check for tears, before I'd lost my physical sensations. My cheeks were damp, 
and my eyes stung as I sobbed. I wept for everything I'd lost and would lose. I wept for my mother and wondered if she could hear me somewhere out there, even though no sounds came from my body. I pictured the abyss as an entity with a gaping maw, gobbling up my tears. I recalled the way the light from my flashlight had been absorbed into the entity's stomach, always starving, never satiated. I envisioned it swallowing everything it touches, devouring the things I loved the most, with no concept of remorse. I was convinced that the abyss was gnashing at my bones, contorting my flesh between its teeth. I couldn't feel anything besides the fear. I pictured myself at 11 years old again, staring the abyss in the face and having no idea. I remembered the way my mother listened to me, calmly. I remembered how she warned me about this and took precautions to ensure I never end up back here in the belly of the inky beast. Yet, there I was. I let the abyss savor the taste of my terror. This is what I deserved for daring to re-enter its domicile. I had been warned. I don't know how long I spent in its stomach. I gave up on any sense of time the moment I entered. I guessed that I was there for multiple eternities. It didn't matter, because I knew I'd be there for many more. After some time, I'd lost touch with each of my senses, just like before. There were times I thought I heard Mia sobbing beside me, but I knew it was only my regret trying to manifest. I knew I was being punished. It didn't ever last long, just like anything else in the abyss. I wondered if I would ever perish in there. The abyss had taken everything from me, except my fear. I wondered if it would ever show me that kind of mercy. I wondered if the beast would ever let me be at peace with my fate. I wondered if the darkness around me would ever feel like a warm embrace. But the abyss only ever seemed to punish me for my weakness. It was only once I stopped my wondering that the beast returned my sensations to me. I thought this was what I wanted, until I realized that my sensations were given back to me in the form of cold hands pushing down on my throat. The force was jarring. I opened my mouth to scream, as if it would help, but it felt as though my mouth was filled with rushing water. I was drowning, being forced downwards by something intangible. Why? I thought, but the void only answered back with more pain. A liquid darkness filled my ears, my nose, and finally my eyes. Somehow, my vision was washed out with a darkness that was darker than the endless black of the abyss. Why? I tried to scream, but my lungs were full of the nothingness. My lungs felt like they would burst. I waited the black out, but I knew that wasn't possible. Not in here. I knew it was pointless to beg the void, but I couldn't help it. Please. I heard my own voice from my lips, a sound I thought I'd never hear again. My lungs were still heavy in my body, like they were filled with concrete. Yet, I could hear my own voice. Please, I begged again. I didn't know what else to say. Make this stop. It felt good to speak again, but I knew not to get comfortable. From above me, there echoed another voice. You have to relax, sweetheart. Perhaps the most tender sound I'd ever heard. My mother's voice. I gasped, and, instead of thick oil or concrete, my lungs were filled with a gentle, almost sterile air. I realized then that my eyes had been closed, but I don't know for how long. I didn't think it mattered. When I opened them, I was greeted with the sight of my mother, about five feet above me, with a hand open and extended down towards me. I couldn't move to grab hold of it. I wanted so badly to take her hand and let her pull me out of this nightmare. I wanted to be in her arms. I wanted to cry again, just like when I was a child, lost in this same void. I can't, I spoke, trying to will my hands towards her, but it still wouldn't move. A soft smile crept over her lips. You have to stop struggling. Her words swaddled me like a warm blanket, but I felt frustrated. 
All I could do is struggle, I thought. Doesn't she know that? As if she read my thoughts, my mother answered. You don't have to be here. You came here on your own. But living in the darkness is no way to live. I hated hearing this. Her words stung like a hot blade to my flesh. I just wanted to save you. I squeaked out. At this, Mom moved closer to me. I don't know how she did it. Surrounding her and me was still the endless chasm of blackness that was the abyss. Yet she effortlessly moved towards me. I still couldn't move. My senses were engulfed in her presence. Her smell, her warmth. I could feel all of it as she closed in and wrapped her arms around me in a familiar embrace. At first, I fought back my tears. But I knew what mum would say. Don't fight it. I let them flow. The warmth of my own tears in my cheeks felt like pure relief. I sobbed into my mum's shoulder while she kept her arms gripped tight around me. It felt so good not to feel like I was floating away. Aren't you scared in here? My words choked out, muffled by her shoulder. I peeked up to see her, still smiling. I realised it then. She was just happy to see me. I felt her pulling away. And, as much as I wanted to grasp for her, I knew I couldn't. I saw her inhale as she spoke softly to me again. You have to go back to the light, sweetheart, and stay there. This place isn't for you. You will grieve and slowly work your way back to normal. I know you can do it. I'll be waiting for you when it's your time. I love you so much, and I'm so proud of you. But, it's time for you to go home. I gazed upon the abyss as my mother's form was swallowed back up, bit by bit. Wait, I wanted to scream. Don't go yet, I've barely said anything. I still wanted to tell you I love you. But I knew somehow that she already knew. And I knew what she would say. And I knew that she was right. Just as the last of her form was drowned out by the darkness, that same darkness was replaced with a blinding light. This light was painful, but not unbearable. Following it was a consistent, mechanical beeping just near me, but I couldn't turn my head to see what was making it. I squinted and waited for my eyes to make sense of my surroundings. I could hear mixed voices chattering away nearby. I took a deep breath in, loud enough to make a sound. The air tasted smooth and clean. I heard the sound of quick, excited footsteps behind me and then a figure in my field of view. My vision took its time to unblur and focus, but when I did, I saw Mia stood at the foot of my bed. Except, it wasn't my bed. I was in a hospital bed. Behind her followed a nurse with a clipboard in hand. I could see the sun coming up through the hospital windows. Mia spoke first, with the widest grin her lips would allow. You're awake. I could see her bouncing on her heels. She turned to the nurse. Can I hug her? The nurse nodded and replied with a smirk. It's not like I could stop you before. Mia nearly tackled me with a hug. I thought I would fall out of bed if there weren't guards on the sides. Her embrace was warm and I hoped she wouldn't let go. She didn't. She only buried her face deeper into my neck. I could feel her arms trembling around me and the words came out in whimpers. I was so worried. You weren't answering your phone or anything. When the paramedics got there, they said you'd been passed out for hours. Mia took frantic breaths between words. I was so scared. I felt my hospital gown getting wet from her tears. I mustered my strength to lift an arm and drape it around her. I'm sorry. My voice came out in a quiet rasp. I wanted to say more to comfort her. I wanted to let Mia know that I wouldn't leave her again, that I planned to push forward and pass the darkness. Somehow though, just like my mom, I knew that she knew. And I knew that she would be there for me while I worked my way back into the light and beyond the darkness. <laughs>